Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Barnett, my colleague here, J.D. Chase, and we uh, are both notionally solar nerds, and we're really excited to share a little bit about our outlook for the future of solar and energy writ large. So I'm going to show you some of my favorite charts. And this is one that the solar team at Bloomberg NEF puts a lot of time into. It's photovoltaic installations, historical and our current forecast out to 2035. And I just want to point out that last year, the world installed about 444 gigawatts of solar modules, which was about 76% up from the year before. It was mostly in China. And this is a lot. I mean, total global power generation capacity of all kinds was about, about 9.3 gigawatts at, um, at the end of 2023. So 444 gigawatts of solar is a lot. Jenny, so you said 76% growth, right? Year and, on year. And for anyone who doesn't think <coughs> in growth, that is just a staggering number. You know, in, in a good year, oil demand might grow 1%. That's true, but it still really sucks to be a solar manufacturer. I kind of messed up my slide transition there, but the reason for this rapid growth is that solar modules are, are, are much, much cheaper than they used to be. Back in 1976, you'd pay about $100 per watt of solar modules. A watt is the standardized unit of solar modules. Um, back in 2011, you'd pay about $1.5 per watt. And today, in normal markets, i.e. not the US, oh, sorry. I messed up my slide transition, but now I've, messed, I've gone back. In normal markets, you'd pay about 10 US cents per watt for solar modules. And this is partly because solar manufacturing is so competitive, the companies have viciously competed to, get, to make solar modules with less and less materials, with thinner wafers, with a better recipe to get more efficiency out of it. And also, they're not making very much money, which we'll come back to. But the main reasons for this incredible decline are basically technology improvements. And 10 cents a watt is so cheap that over in Europe, we actually have started talking about just using them as fencing material. The cost is kind of comparable with um, wooden panelling, actually. You can tell my team's middle-aged because we noticed that. Ginny, i got to say, I've never seen one of these in the US. Are, are we going to start seeing solar fences in the US? Probably not, because you've got these amazing trade tariffs against China, which um, make everything more expensive for you. <laughs> But the US is growing as a solar market. You installed about 37 gigawatts of solar panels last year, and we expect the US market to keep growing to 2030. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, this event, and so I'm just going to show you our forecast before the IRA passed. So, first of all, it was a lot lower. The IRA has really increased our expectations for the US market. Mind you, our forecast was a bit low even for 2023, to be honest. And yeah, it has made a huge difference to US build. On that front, Ginny mentioned that here in the US, we are paying more for solar panels. Uh, this is First Solar up at the top, paying about 30 cents a watt. First Solar, if you don't know it, they're kind of like our national champion of, of solar module makers. They're at scale, they're here in the US. Maybe like an axon of the solar industry. Uh, the black line is the uh, declining cost curve uh, price per watt that Jenny showed you on the other side. And so right now, uh, because of the IRA, because of the tariff situation, you know, the manufacturers in the U.S. are really enjoying some premium pricing. If you want to go to the next slide, this will, I think, really help clarify. I love hockey stick charts, especially if there's a good news story associated with them. And this is the U.S. manufacturing spending, uh, and suddenly on, on, on uh, solar plants, EV facilities, all kinds of things, and suddenly you see it take off in uh, just a couple of years ago, and that's passage of the IRA that suddenly allowed this, this thing to take off. There was also a, a bill called the CHIPS Act. So we were really building out uh, this, the energy supply chain here in the US. Uh, if you don't know it, about 80% of the solar supply chains in China. And so there was a conscious decision, I think, in the US to sort of say, hey, we want clean energy, but we also want to make the equipment here in the US. And so that's what you're seeing here with this chart. Ginny. And the US taxpayers are paying for it instead of China. Um, and seriously, though, 
I don't know whether the US government is subsidizing solar module manufacturing because it is such a horrible business. These are some of the largest solar module makers in the world, and this is the earnings they made in the first quarter of this year. Um, now, most of them made pretty significant losses. I mean, Longi, the, probably the, the leader in this space, lost hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> Could we go back to that slide, please? <laughs> Meanwhile, um, First Solar, okay, that is one company that did make rather a nice profit in, um, in, in the first quarter. But it's the US taxpayers that are paying for that. And um, Well, just a moment. you know, I, I will observe on your prior slide that First Solar is uh, doing pretty well financially. They were one of the most profitable uh, solar module makers. That was a 1Q slide. And uh, kind of what's going on there, because if, if you don't know the context, First Solar has about less than 3% of global market share, yet they're making all of the profit and there's a sort of a competition death match occurring between some of the Chinese module makers. And just to really hit home how important the IRA is for that, this is the gross margin of First Solar. Just historical, no forecast. And it's, a, it's running at about a 45% gross margin business. Uh, investors tend to like that thing. That's a, that's a pretty good level of profit. But if you were to back out the IRA tax provisions, and they have good disclosures, so it's pretty easy to do that. They drop to about a 20% gross margins business. So if there is a, a political change in the US this fall, uh, this is something to keep an eye on because we have really set up the game for domestic manufacturers. And it is an, it is an open book. Uh, Jenny, uh, Meyer Berger, uh, one of Europe's uh, sort of really only sol solar equipment suppliers is actually in the process of picking up shop and moving over here to the States to take advantage of this apparent policy benefit. They're not on my chart because I only charted major module manufacturers. I mean, this is all true, but Americans do pay significantly more for solar power than in normal markets. This is the typical cost, the average cost of building a home solar system in Germany and the US, normalized per watt. And the yellow line here is Germany, um, and the blue line is the US, and come on, U.S. citizens, thanks to all the complications and all the, all the lawyers involved in the tax credit system and the trade tariffs, are paying about 50% more than German buyers. You know, one of the things that strikes me about this slide, Jenny, is you've got the module price on here again. It's the one in red. You can almost give away the modules for free and very close to zero. And most of the cost of putting up solar on the roof is the lawyers, the, uh, the, the folks up on ladders, that kind of thing. And so... Um, yeah, if you want to go to the next slide, you know, one of the things that is contributing to that cost component is here in the U.S., the, the sort of paradigm is shifting a little bit, and we're, we've gone from saying, hey, let's just put solar panels wherever they can go to adding battery storage alongside that. So we've got three really large uh, residential installers in the U.S., Sunrun, uh, Sonova, and SunPower, and uh, we're, we're seeing them approach about a 50% battery attach rate. And I think batteries are a good part of the narrative, as you are quite aware, Jenny. You've been doing this a while. We don't have the sun at night, so that is helpful. I bet one of those goes bankrupt. But I have a new favorite chart, thanks to batteries. Um, this, is a, this is a typical day in, a California power, in the California power grid from 2012 to 2023. Back in 2012, you can see that California imported a huge chunk of its power, that orange bit, and it also generated a huge amount from natural gas. Now, by 2015, you can see some solar coming in to cut the gas burn, and also you've got rooftop solar, which is meaning that the um, daytime peak, the air conditioning peak, is a bit lower. By 2023, there is so much solar in the middle of the day that the, the state is actually exporting power sometimes for a few hours. And there's other interesting things happening here. So first of all, less gas is being burned. About 14% <coughs> less gas is burned in 2023 than in 2012. And about 65% pow less power is imported to the state. And you've also got hydro that is being used differently. So this blue, dark blue bit is hydro. And basically, in the middle of the day, the state is letting the dams fill up 
and then dispatch in the evening to reduce the gas burn. <coughs> and the, my favourite thing about this chart is that little pink bit. Those are batteries. Those are batteries doing exactly what batteries ought to be doing with solar. They are charging in the middle of the day and they are discharging in the evening to reduce this gas peak. So it's working. That's right. I think it is working. And so, you know, a kind of farewell thought is this is the CO2 intensity uh, of the power sector. So tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. Uh, the black line up at the top is the U.S. national average. Uh, California, the uh, golden bar, uh, California was already a bit uh, cleaner to start with. But we're seeing progress uh, because of all of the solar, because of the batteries, and because of the phenomena you've just described, uh, just uh, just hit the wire in the last day or two. But for the first time uh, here in the U.S., uh, wind generation is providing more power to the grid nationally than coal, and that is a big part of the story. So I I'm optimistic. When I think out to 2050, you know, we might quibble a little bit on sort of the full what the full portfolio looks like, but I think both of these lines are going to trend down. So I think we're we're seeing a lot of progress here in the states uh, because of not just solar, but because of the broader energy transition. And uh, so if you leave here with uh, any sort of like happy <laughs> narrative, it's that, you know, solar's working. There's some companies that uh, can figure out how to make money in it, but maybe not all of them. And there is a path to net zero. All right, but a lot of companies are going bust. <laughs> this has always happened in solar. Okay, that's it from us. Now there is a short break, and then please join the green stage for the afternoon plenary program. And also, just one last advertisement. Uh, if you're already a Bloomberg.com subscriber, that's great. Uh, but on your badge, if you're not, uh, you, sh you should have a QR code that you can scan and give you three months free access to Bloomberg.com. So make sure to do that if you, if you haven't already.
Amazing programming. A couple of reminders just before we start. We are going to allow you to submit questions today. So if you can scan this QR code behind me and that will allow you to do some questions to the speakers and also a couple of fun polls. We also want you to keep engaging across the afternoon. So if you can hashtag BBG Green Festival um, on all the social media fronts. We also tomorrow evening have a sunset party in Myrtle Park. We thought it was really important to get you out of these theatres and into, into Seattle. So join us. It is a fun run. You do not have to run. You can come and just party and cheer. So that's at Myrtle Edward Park tomorrow night. And then we also have some more, as Meg said, upstairs on Friday and Saturday with our restaurant programs as well. Before we get any further, I would like to just invite you to enjoy the conversation this afternoon. We'll begin with climate science and how researchers are cutting, uh, using cutting edge findings to communicate with animals. So let's find out. Please welcome to the stage Christoph Koch, neuroscientist and meritorious investigator at the Allen Institute for a conversation with Bloomberg's Aggie D'Souza. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome. Um, so um, I've got a food word in my uh, title, so you probably may guess that part of we're going to touch on eating animals. Um, but there's so much more to it, I think, uh, when talking about the climate transition um, and solving those big challenges, we have to rethink our relationship uh, with nature and with animals. And we're here with Christoph uh, to talk about how science, uh, how our better understanding of animals can help us get there. Um, Christoph, uh, you are a renowned um, expert in the study of consciousness. Could you please tell us about your work? What is consciousness? Um, what are the differences in consciousness between people, humans, and animals? So by consciousness, uh, I mean experience, seeing, hearing, dreading, Im Im ex expecting, imagining, fearing, loving, hating, all those states, those are all states of consciousness. And the, the challenge with consciousness, the classical um, mind-body problem is to understand how, how, how a physical system like my brain, the organ of consciousness, can give rise to these feelings. But we live in a world where we have feelings, and so the question is, how far do these feelings reach? So certainly um, babies, we believe, although they can't tell us directly, uh, we believe they have feelings. Um, how do we know that other people have feelings? You know, logically, it's possible that none of you have feeling that I'm the only conscious person. This is known as ontological solipsism. It's perfectly logical, uh, compatible with everything I know. It's extremely unlikely. So typically we ask, how are you? And you'll tell me, oh, today I'm really depressed because of whatever, the election. Um, <laughs> but ultimately what, I will, uh, what, what I'm asking, what, what is your current conscious experience? Now, I can't do that with everyone. I can't do that with babies. I can't do that with behavioral unresponsive patients in the clinic. And of course, we can't do that with animals. So then we have to use, we have to do what's called technically an abduction. We infer consciousness as the most likely explanation. So animals, particular mammals, you know, we are mammals like the cats and dogs and great apes and, and lions and all of those. And our brains are very similar. If I give you a little bit of, of a monkey brain or mouse brain or dog brain or human brain, no one, no one except an, an expert armed with a microscope can say which, which is which. We have more of it than a mouse, but of course elephant and, and, blue, uh, and orcas have even more brain than we do. And also continuity of behavior. I mean, we know this, uh, Darwin studied this in great detail. There's a great continuity of behavior across all, um, certainly across all mammals, and people are now raising the question in biology, is, is consciousness possibly coextensive with all animals or possibly even with all life, with every member of life? I mean, that's, that's you, you touched on a topic about the expanding um, 
understanding of different species. And I was just curious, maybe think, um, how many of you in the audience, raise your hands, have watched uh, the documentary, My Octopus Teacher? I've, and of all of, of, all of you, how has that helped you rethink, have you re rethought your relation, I mean, your understanding of octopus, would you, you know, consider eating it again? You still, there are some hands, but not, not all of them. Um, I'm just kind of, you know, curious to know, I mean, how are we expanding that uh, understanding that, um, of, of species and uh, kind of relating to them? Or, um, you know, we used to, before it was, you know, em empathizing with dogs, with, with pets, but now, you know, people are actually, you know, experiencing that with the octopus or with different species. Where are we going with it? Well, we're enlarging sort of the membership of sentient creatures, right? As we know more about the world and more about animals, we're returning to an ancient knowledge because, you know, several thousand years ago in more animist society, we all assumed that animals have spirits similar to us. And we are, in some sense, we're returning to that with the realization, the growing realization, that even if you look at insects like bees, you know, bees have something known as play. They can recognize individual beekeepers, uh, beekeepers. They have a complex uh, social structure. They have this, uh, this dance, a waggle dance. I can tell them about a the, the location and the angle relative to the sun of a food source. So they're very complicated features. And if you look at the hormones that they have, it's very similar to our hormones. So it's quite likely that if a bee has drunk a little bit of a golden nectar and is now returning to its sister in the hive, that it too feels some sense of accomplishment just because of the great similarity between the behavior and the underlying hardware between us and them. And so I wonder about the practical um, applications of all that knowledge. What can we use it for? How can it help uh, guide our conservation strategies, our, you know, how we think about nature, how we think about, um, you know, the way we treat animals for different functions, for, uh, by different industries, what were your thoughts on that? Well, we should maybe treat animals not just as, uh, as means to an end, i.e. to, for instance, just for us to, to enjoy them or to eat them, but as an end, just like us, that they too have a life that's bookended between two eternities, just like you and I, that they too can joy, enjoy the sounds and sights, they can also suffer. And many of these animals suffer atrociously, particularly in industrial, you know, industrial uh, meat keeping. And so I think that does have implications for how we behave, among others, how we eat, or um, the way we think about what we should eat, that we should all be sort of more conscientious, more deliberate consumer of, if we do eat animal products, we should do that more deliberately and maybe less frequently. Because ultimately, that meat that you see on your, on, your, on your dish in a fancy restaurant, the supermarket, that is associated with a great deal of suffering, particularly if it comes from industrial source uh, slaughterhouses, as most of the meat, certainly in this country, comes from. So does it mean that basically, we, we, you know, consumption of meat uh, is growing? People are still eating. I think one of the ways to curb consumption is actually the price and inflation, and that's where we've seen some impact, but people continue to do it. Why do you, I mean, what does it take to make people realize that, you know, empathize with animals or understand the suffering or where are we going? Or will it be the case that it will never change and we we're just going to be shutting off no, some thinking? Progress. No, no, there is progress. There's no reason to be pessimistic. There's progress. We have animal laws, for instance, 300 years ago, we didn't have them, right? We had the first animal laws in Victorian England, 1870 or something like that, right? We have societies for the protection of cruelty of animals. There's also, even in this country, right, in, in California now, it's illegal now to, to, to feed, force feed geese, right, for uh, foie gras. So things are changing. They could always change faster. There's this growing movement here in, in the U.S. or elsewhere towards, you know, alternative to meats, either lab-grown meat or, you know, impossible, impossible meat, beyond meat, etc. There are lots of alternatives, and to the extent that we educate ourselves about these uh, alternatives and that they can not only, you know, minimize suffering but also have vastly lessen the environmental uh, impact that, that are otherwise very expensive uh, in terms of environmental cost of keeping uh, beef. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> so there is change, there is progress. It may be slow, but things are happening. We shouldn't lose uh, sight of the long-term goal to reduce the suffering of all conscious creatures and help, help the planet. I'd like to open it up to the audience. Does anyone have any questions or would like to, <coughs> if we have some in the back? Do we have a microphone? Mm. So I can't see if anyone has a microphone to help with. You just speak up. Yeah. Hey, if, um, if you're finding that plants have a lot of emotions and feelings and ability to communicate, then won't that put another kink in the works of deciding what we can eat without causing pain and suffering? I think it's a very good question. So I think it's all a question of relative degree, right? Uh, we have laws that says thou shalt not kill, but then of course there's exception in war, in self-defense, and there's abortion, etc. So like any other moral decision, there are no absolute, and we should just try to sort of, at least animals that are very close to us, that uh, mean close evolutionary, that also have high capacity to be conscious, that can experience uh, sort of, uh, in a differentiated way, similar to us. Most mammals are of, the, of that ilk. We should maybe avoid those or minimize those. And, and, def and, and uh, you know, of course, we have to eat something and eat animals that have lower or lesser degree of consciousness. There is a ladder you can measure. I mean, there are some theories now that start to measuring the extent of consciousness, the, 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 the quantity of consciousness in any one system. And so you can certainly sort of, there are, degra there are gradations and that has to apply to, to plants as well. Right now, the idea of plant consciousness is still considered by most people very far out, but it's not impossible. And if you look at the complexity of even plant cells, n we, there's nothing in, in our technological environment right now that gets even closer to the complexity of a single plant cell. So it may well be possible. Um, maybe let's start with the back. You, you guys were first. It's a very good question, which is now, of course, being asked increasingly in terms of ChatGPT, right? So A, the program you're referring to models the, the worm C. elegans as a nematode. It has 302 neurons and 1,018 cells. Yes, you can certainly simulate that, and you, you can get this, this creature in a simulated environment to do all sorts of things that are worm-like. But, that but that's different from actually instantiating the causal power of, the, of that organism. Where it matters is, think about it. You can simulate a rainstorm, it doesn't get wet inside your computer. You can write down the, the differential equation for Einstein's theory of general relativity, right? You can write them down, you can simulate them, you can simulate the mass at the center of our galaxy, that's three million solar masses, that's so powerful it bends space-time around it and turns into a black hole. But funny enough, when you run that simulation, you don't have to be afraid that you're gonna be sucked into that computer simulation <laughs> because it's just a simulation. Same thing with consciousness. Consciousness is actually, I think, the, the way I think about it, it's, ca it's, it's causal power. And you, can't, you, can, you can simulate that, but you can only simulate the, the behavior of, or, uh, associated with that. You, you will never get a conscious creature, so this worm will not be conscious, and ChatGPT or you know GPT 5.0 maybe you know in a couple of years from now will be able will po probably be more intelligent than any of us will certainly have better memory, but it will not feel like anything. It'll feel as much as your trash compactor. The same difference as between mass, uh, simulating mass, and actually the ability of mass to bend space-time around it, causal power. Mass turns out as causal power to bend space-time, and space-time conforms to that, right? That's Einstein. Same thing with, with consciousness. Consciousness is not just some 
airy fairy thing that you can com uh, you know co that you can co um, and compute is actually causal power of a system like the brain, the most complex piece of organized matter in the known universe, to exercise causal power upon itself. And you have to build that into the system. So possibly with quantum computers, or possibly with, with what's known as neuromorphic computers, computers that are built in close image of the of the of a brain they might be conscious, but certainly not digital computers as we build them, you know, for Neumann architecture as they run in the cloud right now. Thank you. I, I'm going to take one from here because it's, uh, and, and I'm conscious we, we've got so much to go through. Where are we with regards to communicating meaning, meaningfully with other animals and how do you think that may play a role in helping us work towards addressing climate change? Okay, the first question is how many of you are sort of live your life with a cat or a dog. Do you think you can communicate in a meaningful way with your cat and dog? Yes? yes? yes. Okay, so I think people, they, you can certainly do that. You can do that with all sorts of creatures, including with a, a cephalopod, like you know the, the octopus, that's evolutionary, very, very distant related, much more distant related than we are related to cats and dogs. So it's certainly possible. I don't know what that means for climate change. <laughs> Very honest. Um, and several ancient belief systems have the idea of all life uh, have feelings and consciousness. Why does this come as a new idea? Well, it's, an, it's a new, it's an, well, it, partly it comes within the Western tradition, which is, of course, shaped by Christianity, where, where sort of we are exceptional, right? You know, René Descartes, very famous, you know, dualist, sort of father of modern uh, uh, mind-body philosophy, right? He says, we, only we, you know, if my carriage hits a dog, the dog will squeal, but only we have uh, cognitive st stuff, you know, thinking stuff, the soul, and the animals, so the animals just reflex, right? So for the longest, we believe that humans are exceptional, we are exceptional, we are different from anything else in the universe, which is, of course, baloney. We evolved just like all these other creatures evolved. So this goes back to a much more ancient belief that we're all part of the universe, that we're all in soul, that we all have sentient to a lesser or a larger degree. So clearly my dog doesn't know about the weekend or about Bloomberg or about relativity, <laughs> right? But my dog knows a lot about food and about what he likes, what he dislikes, and he, he and she can smell and, you know, has, a, has an entire sensorium, entire umwelt that's that's different from us, but it's also highly, highly sophisticated. And that's true for, for dogs just as well for any other creature. And, it's, and, and even within Western tradition, there's this a thing known as biopsychism. So, so you may have he heard panpsychism, which is this very old idea, both in the West as well as in Eastern tradition, that everything is in soul, including this little guy. Um, biopsychism is, is the idea that, that, that consciousness is specifically related to anything on the, in the tree of life, which we don't know whether it's true, but it's a very interesting idea that people are beginning to explore now. Any uh, gentleman in orange? So uh, on the topic of, you talked about food consumption, I was talking about food waste, right? So humans have a lot of food waste, right? So I think 15 to 20 percent of our intended consumption goes to waste. What other contents is animals have a similar waste in their food consumption? Cats. <laughs> are, you, are you a dog person? I'm a dog person. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true <laughs> that I know many cat people, they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and from them, you know, you, you, the cats kill birds. And most of the time, they just kill the birds and don't eat it. So you can think of that, that's wasteful, right? So it's, again, we're not that different, right? We, we are species, um, like many other species, we are more powerful in certain ways, no question about it. And so we have this food waste, but it's not that other uh, sort of uh, species are innocent of that. They, they also have it, particularly if we let them develop that. Thank you. 
don't, does that warrant the, that we incite and discriminate? Just to repeat, do the fish have consciousness? What level? It's the, I mean, it, again, the, you know, it depends on the complexity and the size of the brain, you know, to first order. So, you know, some, uh, creatures like fish, they do have brains. They, I think, it, at, given all the evidence, they likely also experience the world in a different way, right? They swim through water and, and their olfactory system is somewhat different. But I have little doubt that a fish will too, and certainly they have pain. They have certainly pain receptors that respond in very similar ways to your and, uh, and, and, and my pain receptor. So I think consciousness is very widespread, including as we as we mentioned early on in in octopus and squid and other and and other uh, animals. And if we if we choose to eat them, fine. But then we should be conscious of that, and we should do it deliberately, and we should put sort of try to put some limits on it, including in in fish. Maybe not eat fish every day. Partly, of course, here we have the problem. We have orcas that, you know, the, uh, the, north, uh, the southern orcas here, there are only 76 members left of this glorious species because you, we eat too much salmon. We love Chinook salmon, and so maybe we ought to eat less of it. Uh, the time has flown by, and we don't have much time, but I just was curious to know, just to ask you about your personal journey. I think you, you were a vegetarian. I mean, how did that come about? Science, yeah. through science? Uh, well, yes and no. So, yeah, I grew up in a, you know, in a, uh, in a meat-loving uh, family. Meat, the taste of meat is, of course, very deeply ingrained in our culture. I literally got it, you know, with my, no, not quite with my mother's milk, but very early on. But then as a scientist, I realized, you know, by, you know that, that these other creatures are conscious too. Maybe I shouldn't be eating them, but again, it was too powerful. But then I had this transformative experience where my dog was dying that night, nosy, a black German shepherd, was dying in my arms, and I was distraught. I was crying, and I was distraught, and I thought to myself, how can I be so distraught about the death of this creature? But at the same time, I still love eating similar creatures like lamb and, and pork. And then that night, I decided I'd honor my dog. This is now 16 years ago. I honor my dog by never touching another piece of flesh, which I haven't done. So it does take sometimes this, this emotional impetus to turn this insight that, you know, I probably shouldn't be doing this anymore, but I still do it because I find it very difficult to not do, then to have some emotional trigger like that to help you over that hurdle and then say, okay, I'm done now with meat. Just a final word of advice or anything that you want to say? Yeah, just be conscientious. I mean, you know, I'm not going to judge anyone. We're all free to do what, what we want, but then, you know, it, and it, it doesn't have to be absolute. People always say, well, do I have to stop eating every, uh, anything from animal? Do I have to turn it into extreme vegan? No. It's all a question of relative, and any difference will make a difference. So be conscientious in your consumption, in your choices. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Your I lost my little man. Yes. Please welcome to the stage Sarah Zodi, founding principal of Studio Zodi, for conversation with Bloomberg's Brian Kahn. I think we're good. Uh, well, I'm very excited to talk with Sarah today. Um, just so folks know, if you've been seeing her, you probably have already heard this, but I will tell you again. Uh, the QR code up there, if you have a question about anything landscape architecture related, uh, please scan the code, drop it in the box, and we will see it up here and we'll happily answer it. Or I guess Sarah will happily answer <laughs> it. <laughs> I'll just be here. Um, but Sarah, I'm really excited to have you here today um, because, well, I guess the first place I want to start. You know, I think a lot of us will think about nature being its own thing, the built environment being its own thing, landscape architecture sounds like it's both those things together. So can you just give us a little sense of what this field actually is? Yeah. Actually, could I get a show of hands how, or if you're familiar with what landscape architecture is? You're good at this, I should have asked. Oh, that's a good number of people. I wonder how, what percentage of that population believes it to mostly be designing backyards? Because um, <laughs> that's typically what I get. Um, I am a landscape architect, and what is landscape architecture? I mean, broadly speaking, we're trained to design and shape land. Um, 
the term landscape architecture is originates from the mid 19th century and is typically associated with Frederick Law Olmsted. How many folks are familiar with who Frederick Law Olmsted is? The same people raising their hands. Um, and he coins this term uh, because of his belief that it's different than the practice of gardening. He believes that it's a profession that can actually engage some of the bigger challenges of the society. And he dedicates himself to largely to public parks. But um, from that tradition, we have a history of about 160 years of landscape architecture in North America um, and, and consequentially uh, around the world of a profession that's trained to design landscapes. And you know, I entered this profession, I'm from the Gulf Coast, and um, when I was in college, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, um, Hurricane Katrina, you know, brewed and barreled towards my home state of Louisiana. And it was that event that really um, prompted me to start to research different professions, different disciplinary frameworks, ways to understand, um, you know, the factors that lead into something like a Hurricane Katrina from an ecology standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, politics, uh, and its aftermath. And then, you know, what might be an empowering framework to actually intervene and, and shape those factors, you know, um, looking ahead. Okay, so this is a very high level view, and I'm wondering if you can give us a few, um, like, concrete, sorry, no pun intended, um, a few <laughs> concrete examples of what landscape architecture actually looks like. Funny that you ask. I can pull up some images. Um, if we could get um, some images up on the screen. So I can share a few um, examples of projects that my office, um, I'm the principal of a firm called Studio Zodi, we're based in New York City. And a lot of our work is actually around mitigating and adapting the changes in land. You know, climate change is not something in the future, our climate is changing, our land is changing. And therefore, we have to devise ways to live in a, in a rapidly changing and dynamic landscape. Um, landscape architecture is no longer, cannot just be about pretty paths and places to picnic. These, you know, we have to have an infrastructural lens on the places uh, that we love. This is a project that um, we're working on in Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. It's the lowest lying world capital. Um, and our client is the World Monuments Fund. And this is a historically significant island in the history of Liberia. Um, but it is kind of at the front lines of a lot of the ecological vulnerability that the region is facing. And so the design is very much about uh, mangrove restoration, ecological restoration, but at the same time being able to tell the historical and cultural narratives um, of conflict, resolution, and peace uh, that the country has seen since 2005. And so, uh, you know, issues of climate change are, are not distinct or separate from how we understand um, national narratives, cultural narratives, and cultural resilience. Uh, and so this is another project that we're working on in Washington, D.C. Uh, with, you know, the climate getting warmer, this particular neighborhood that has seen a lot of historical disinvestment is seven degrees hotter on average than another neighborhood in the same city. And so the design of this landscape then is really about optimizing canopy um, and shade uh, and about creating an urban oasis. Just to you know, create a space to even be outside requires quite a bit of investment and attention going forward. In this particular case, we're also creating a microclimate using water features and that kind of thing. This is a project in Philadelphia called Graffiti Pier. Um, Philadelphia is actually a city, the city that invented graffiti. They like to let us New Yorkers know. And um, this site, Graffiti Pier, is important to that history and legacy. And um, in 25 years, it'll be inundated just by high tides. So we've been actually working with graffiti writers to um, come up with an approach to removing the bulkheads and introducing an intertidal landscape so that this park can shift upland um, and inland as the tides continue to rise. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll end with one more project. This is Dia Beacon, um, a museum in upstate New York where that lies in a historical floodplain. Toni Morrison has this incredible quote where she talks about 
um, the idea of flooding and that a lot of languages don't even have the word flooding. Uh, she says we should think of flooding as remembering. It's the land remembering where, where water once was. Um, and so the design of this landscape is really about recalling the historic floodplain of the river, embracing water, making water visible to how we understand the land. Um, and so we've been designing uh, a series of sculptural landforms that help make visible the history um, and presence of water as it continues to um, change over the course of time. We're converting um, five acres of lawn into over 90 uh, species of native species of meadows, um, and really making the way that we're designing land for change, not an infrastructure project solely, but also a cultural, um, recreational, you know, um, and, and kind of important to our cultural lives, central to our cultural lives. So that gives you maybe a sense of, of how I'm thinking about the role that landscape design plays in a changing climate. Okay, that was an incredible sense. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was the best sense I could imagine. Thank you. Um, and I do want to stick on this project at Dia Beacon sure. for a sec, because this is a place um, you know, I visited a few times, and if you had asked me, is this place in a flood floodplain? I would have said, I don't think so. But it, it is, and it sounds like you're making this visible to people like me who clearly didn't get the memo. But how do you sort of uncover this? How do you come to see the landscape that did exist? That's a really great question. And actually, I, I blame my profession for your experience of the land and how we experience the land broadly. I mean, we don't even know what the native plants of the places that we live look like. Um, so landscape architecture has neutralized how we understand the earth. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in the potential for that to be expressed as a way to mobilize our consciousness around climate change. Um, now, how do we understand that? Typically, we, you know, my practice is really about a lot of research, and I don't mean just Google. I mean um, observation. Wait, more than Google? I know. <laughs> I mean observing uh -huh. the land, and that's something. That's a practice that takes a lot of time, and that I encourage you all to do in the landscapes that you all inhabit. Looking down at the ground, looking where is the presence of water? Why do these plants grow here versus these plants grow here? You know, a, a, you don't have to, you know, read a report. The earth is a collection of its paths, pasts. And so we do a lot of research um, in a lot of different ways. That project, in particular, we also spoke with indigenous people about the history of that site. So all of these different ways of knowing are really important to being able to unlock and express, you know, the, the dynamism of a particular place. And I mean, Dia Beacon is a, is a fairly nice museum. I'm going to guess it has some money to spend on these kinds of things. And Philadelphia is a large city. DC, also a large city. These are places that have a lot of capital to spend on making these landscapes. Liberia strikes me as a place that probably doesn't have that same level of capital investment. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you make sure that this really important work is available to everyone? Yeah. I mean, um Landscape architecture has an interesting, and landscapes have an interesting role to investment. I mean, some of the highest value real estate on planet Earth lines Central Park, and so how we how we invest in landscapes, they, there's a, actually a lot of um, wealth that can be generated from that, and there are some interesting models that are being developed around capturing that value and making planning around investment. Um, as you design landscapes, a part of how we think about the process, and so I, you know, I'm really excited about the possibility of thinking ahead of time about um, the kind of impacts and uh, the economic impacts of landscapes, um, particularly in places like a Liberia. And so they're really interested in that particular case around this being an investment around tourism, um, and you know, all of the kind of um, implications of that. So I. I th I'm really excited about how how this can mobilize and catalyze a lot of different futures for people. And to do that, I mean, I feel like in some ways, you know, there's the way things have been done, right? And then what you're doing is maybe reimagining. You're telling a different story to people, essentially. And I'm wondering, I mean, yeah, what is the role of landscape architecture in particular about telling different stories about the future? We know things need to change to deal with the climate that we have or that's on the way. How do you tell people a different future than doom and gloom? Yeah, I'm, you know, it's less than 1% of planet Earth is 
the, the Earth's surface is designed by a landscape architect. So I'm not going to sit up here and tell you like we're going to save everything, but um, but because of the densification of the population on planet Earth, actually that under one percent of the Earth's surface plays a big role in our lives, um, and so. I think the stories that we tell and the experiences that we shape in those landscapes that we share in public spaces can help catalyze, you know, r really, you know, people's understanding of the earth is through these landscapes. And um, that's a big part of the legacy of, of someone like a Frederick Law Olmsted. He really believed in that. He really believed that, and that's why he advocated for something like 900 acres of a central park. That this is the scale of, of infrastructure that's critical to a democracy. It's critical to understanding our relationship to the earth, our relationship to one another uh, as a part of a civic society. And so I really see, you know, the, the work of shaping public lands and public landscapes as being catalytic to those questions of how we relate to the earth and how we relate to one another in a democracy. So actually, just to stick on the Central Park example for a second, I want to take a question I see here from our audience. Um, you know, this is a question about, do you, you know, do you ever use non-native plants in your, in your work? I mean, Central Park is lovely, but there are yeah. certainly parts that are not native uh, yeah, to New York. large parts. Yeah, and so, <laughs> you know, it. when you do that, how yeah. do you decide to make that choice? That's a really great question, and I actually, I'm maybe an atypical landscape architect in this regard. I, I think the idea of native plants versus non-native is really fraught. How we understand what native plants are are typically which plants were here when Europeans arrived, which is a relatively arbitrary moment in the constant migration of plants. It's been happening for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and so it presents a really problematic binary. And so I'm actually a little bit more, I, I'd like to take a more nuanced approach to understanding how a plant operates in its context. Um, how, you know, is it a friendly neighbor to its community? Um, and, and also in a changing climate, knowing that these things are, are dynamic. And um, so what is native and non, I mean, we really have to be responsive to new contexts and new conditions. And so I, I while I use the word native plants a lot, I, I you know, or the, the terminology or the framework, I think what's actually more important is the ecological performance of, of the plant. And, and there, it requires some subtlety to really optimize that. And I think that, you know, you bring up this idea that you're working in a changing climate. Like, this is a moving baseline. Like, things Entirely. are going to change. Like, it's you're this right right now, 10 years, it's going to be different. 20 years, 100 years. There's a lot of change that has to happen. Yeah. And so, you know, do you think about, how do you think about, I guess, like, building your landscapes so that they're both able to change, but also maybe withstand some of the, the changes? Or do they have to withstand some of the changes? Yeah, so for instance, in the Graffiti Pier project, you know, the site being so important to the history of graffiti, we, there, ha there's, there are changes. This place is going to be inundated. So a part of you know, the work that, that I'm doing it requires a lot of community engagement, public engagement, finding what is it about this place at, in its core that we love. And you know, coming from the Gulf Coast, where so much has changed and um, we've lost a lot too, I think really being clear with one another about what is if everything's changing around us, what aspects are the most important to us, and then we can design around, uh, you know, sustaining that in some way. It may not be in its exact form. I don't think there's any there's any like purity about that. But if at Graffiti Pier, if what, if what graffiti artists love is, you know, for instance, they were talking about the presence of rocks and mud and keeping it gritty, well, the water is going to continue to rise. We can, we can kind of create that condition in a different way. Um, but I think there's a clarity of narrative of, okay, everything is changing. What in our future, in our fu the future version of this place, what is the most important thing, and how do we design for that? I think is is going to be important. And you know, you're talking about design for folks that are here now that use these places. And I, I know this is a question that also came in from our audience. That I'm really interested in hearing your response to. 
you know, often when you design a beautiful place, people want to live near it. You mentioned, you know, Central Park, some of the most expensive real estate. New York is right on the edges of it. Yeah. And so how do you, you know, make sure you're designing these places for everybody, essentially yeah. public space people can access, but that the areas around them, maybe, you know, how do you, I guess, think about gentrification and that sort of the fringes of those places? I actually don't use the G word. Oh. <laughs> Tell them why. I think it um, lumps together a lot of different forms of change. Whether it's, are we talking about, you know, the appreciation of land values? Are we talking about densification? Or are we talking about racial dynamics? Are we, you know, what are we, or is it an aesthetic? Um, so I, but recognizing the, the, the impact that investments in public landscapes can make, um, you know, we've been working, for instance, with community land trusts around planning for that change and being able to create mechanisms to capture the value that's generated by the investments in public lands. And I've actually, there's a great one here that we in Seattle um, that uh, we we worked with in the past called the Africa Town Community Land Trust, and they've actually been purchasing property. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, Y'all are really the model. I mean, I uh, having worked around the... Oh, somebody got really excited. Um, <laughs> having worked around the country... Oh. <gasps> oh, no. Um, I hope you're okay. Uh, having worked around the country and, and, and around the world, I actually find myself continuing to come back to point to Seattle as a reference and as a model um, in terms of what's, what's possible when a community organization um, is working to collectively organize around, you know, coming up with plans for capturing that, that, that uh, value. And I think the last thing I want to ask you about, which ties us, you're coming back to this place in Seattle. It sounds like a great example, and now I know what I'll do my, this weekend, uh, which is great <laughs> to hear. But, you know, for folks, when we're thinking about their local park, maybe their local public space, you know, why should they care about those places? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, since so many people in the room are familiar with Frederick Law Olmsted, I'll, I'll share, you know, I, I'm, I'm writing a book about him and this kind of under-historicized part of his legacy, which is that, um, you know, he committed himself to designing public landscapes after 14 months in the slave south. He was hired by a then fledgling New York Times, New York Daily Times at the time, 1852 to 1854, um, to write about the conditions of slavery. And he comes back with the kind of an understanding around the impacts that slavery had, the corrosive effects of slavery on a notion of civic society. That slavery, the effects on the enslaved, you know, are not to be questioned, but even on the enslavers, that their ability to see each other as human was also diminished by the practice of enslaving other humans. And so he pointed to a dearth of public institutions and a sense of public good as uh, an effect of slavery. And he committed himself to the idea that it would take hundreds of years to overcome that. And that public space was part of the constellation of, of public good, you know, in education, museums, um, that, that would really help to mitigate those effects. And so seeing, you know, he really saw public space as a facility, a place, a, a training facility for our democracy, for how we relate to one another, that this is a, a kind of a, a neutral place if, if, you know, in an idealized sense, in terms of r relations between people, uh, but also a relationship to the earth and to nature. Uh, and so it, I really do, it's, it's why I entered the field um, is the, belief in that potential that these places can be catalytic to our understanding of the earth and to each other. Thanks, Sarah. That's really interesting. I think it's a great way to think about when I go home, look at my park. I'm in Oakland, so I'll be looking at Lake Merritt. You'll be able to look at Central Park. Um, and I hope everyone here will take a chance to look at There's public spaces in a different way, too. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Please welcome to the stage Gianlager Erlinson, founder and CEO of Enzo.
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gunnlaugur Erlendsson. I, everyone calls me G because my name is unpronounceable. <laughs> and I'm here because we need to talk about tires. Now, who in the room really cares about tires? OK, that's pretty good. Um, tires are boring. They're dirty. They're not sexy. They're black. They're round. They have a hole in the middle. They all look the same. And every car and truck on the planet runs on tires. Without them, we wouldn't have mobility. Without them, we would not have an economy. So everything on this planet would stop if we remove these products out of our ecosystem. So we need tires. But car tires are really carbon intensive. They're mostly made from fossil fuels and other carbon intensive raw materials. And it's bizarre, but if we switched every electric car, every car to electric today, that is, we still have to pump oil out of the ground to make the tires for them. The production of tires is also incredibly carbon intensive. Factories run on fossil fuels. They're highly polluting. And that gives us even more carbon. And these places are generally not very nice places to work either. Tires are also inefficient. That means that when you fuel your car, you end up buying more, more fuel because the efficiency of the tire drags you down. So it costs you more, and again, more carbon. And this is really bad in the United States because at the moment, right now, there is no tire label that tells you what a good tire and a bad tire is. So when you buy one, you have no idea how much fuel economy you are actually going to end up with. So you have actually no choice at the moment to buy a better product. And when it comes to tires, Surprise, they wear down. Every time you stop, start, and turn, your tire is slowly wearing down. And we generate six million tons of tire pollution every single year. And this is partly driven by the fact that the industry is addicted to churn. The whole tire industry is actually focused on selling more tires to grow. And that doesn't favor reduction of pollution, because they don't really want the tires to last too long. So on one hand, we are all responsible for creating this pollution. And if you say, well, I don't want to create tire pollution, that's great. But then don't drive anywhere and don't have anything driven to you and see how that works out for you. Uh, that includes Amazon, no home delivery. And the same pollution we were talking about is also on microplastic. So recently there was a research done that said it's the largest source of primary microplastic pollution into our oceans. And it's really hard to show you primary microplastic pollution in our oceans. Well, I'll come to this image a bit later. But ultimately, we have designed the perfect solution to deliver microplastics into our oceans. And it's called cities and drains. So they're like jet engines. As Soon as it rains, all this pollution we've generated in our urban areas just simply gets washed away. And that is a critical problem. The tire industry has a solution to that. Better drains in cities. That's a good one. Now, the photo, of course, shows you not microplastics, but macroplastics. This is what you do with tires or at least you used to do here in the United States, we would create so-called artificial reefs to generate coral and life in the ocean. The problem is this, that these are by basically, as soon as the tornado or hurricane comes through, these are like wrecking balls. They literally roll all over the seafloor. So destroying everything they touch. And it's actually interesting that they're too toxic for the environment to actually live in. But I'll come to that. Whew. OK, we're there almost. Tires are also responsible for more urban air pollution than tailpipes in many cities. In the UK already, we're breathing more tire dust than tailpipe dust. Now, fun fact, 7 million people die every year from air pollution. 
And the problem is that that's a bigger number than died from COVID during the epidemic every single year. So air pollution is really important. And if tire pollution is now a greater portion of air pollution than tailpipes, we have to address this. And as vehicles get heavier, tire pollution actually gets worse because of the weight of our cars. So to sum it up, we're now breathing tire microplastics, which are toxic. And that is a critical problem. Here in Washington State recently, the scientists identified finally what was causing the salmon die-offs on the west coast of the United States. And they narrowed it down to a material called 6-PPD. Now, according to the California EP EPA, the 6-PPD is the second most toxic aquatic contaminant they ever, ever discovered. It's literally second to a pure poison into our ocean to kill the salmon population. So again, we're breathing toxic microplastic dust from tires. And scientists are now finding this in our bodies doing research. And we don't know what effect it's having on our own health, let alone the environment we live in. And then to cap it all off, at the end of their short life, tires end up in landfills, or if they're lucky, they get incinerated creating more carbon. And the industry gets away with calling it recycling. So imagine if we would just burn all the plastic bottles overnight and call it recycling. The tire industry calls this recycling and gets away with that. Nobody questions that. Again, more carbon. The whole life cycle of a tire, therefore, in a short format is carbon, 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 microplastics, air pollution, toxicity, waste, and then more carbon. And sometimes it just incinerates itself. So, who cares about tires? That's a bit better. Who cares about electric vehicles? Okay. Well, we need EVs because they help us combat climate change. We're not going to be successful in combating climate change without switching aggressively to EVs and making EVs more successful. We desperately need that to happen as soon as possible. And EVs are brilliant. They're highly efficient. So they're so efficient that when you compare an EV to an internal combustion vehicle, an EV is about 75% efficient. An ICE vehicle is about 25, so it's three times more efficient. And when you count the regen, that's when you capture the energy back, that number gets even better. So that's great, but it also means a fun fact. The tire is responsible for most of the energy losses in your vehicle when you drive an EV at slow speeds, anything up to 30 or 40 miles an hour. Your main cause of energy losses is the tire. So if you put a good one on, that's great. You'll keep your range. But it means when you put a bad tire on, you lose a lot of range, much faster than a nice vehicle, because your EV is already three times more efficient. So tire choice is incredibly important when it comes to electric vehicles. So ultimately, we need to make sure that these vehicles are kept at their highest efficiency throughout their whole lives. Here's another fun fact. EVs are also heavy. Everyone knows that. We also have SUVs, which are also really heavy. And all cars are actually getting heavier. But EVs are unique. They have high weight, high torque, We've aggregated them in urban environments with high concentrations where you have that stop, start, and turn traffic generating more tire pollution. And often they're driven very aggressively, specifically when you order something on Amazon and incentivize the driver to do 100 delivery stops in a day and pay him per package. With EVs, Michelin has already said that, e that they wear tires up to 20% faster. Goodyear says up to 50% faster. So, Although all vehicles are getting heavier and tire pollution is becoming a bigger problem, EVs are, again, highly susceptible to efficiencies, but also have that weight. So what should we do? So this is why we set up Enzo. Enzo is a tire company, a tire technology company focused on material science on its mission to make EVs more successful. 
And we do that principally by extending EV range with ultra inefficient tire, efficient tires and reduced tire pollution, while also saving costs every mile. And that's critical for the adoption of this technology. We make our tires more affordable. That means you pay less upfront, and it's effectively a green discount. We do that by cutting out the middlemen. We make the tires more efficient with material science. That gives you the range. It also means less carbon. We make them more durable. That reduces this critical pollution. And we make them longer life. We also address the toxicity. The critical thing is this. We also focus on sustainability at an aggressive pace because we are the only tire company in the world that has set its target to be carbon neutral by 2030. That's two decades ahead of the rest of the tire industry. And we can deliver this all today with existing technologies. That's very important to note. So you might ask, how are we going to do that? How are we going to scale that? Because scale is critical for impact. Technology is nice, but technology without scale doesn't deliver the impact we need. To keep America's economy moving while delivering sustainable growth, electric vehicles need better tires. That's what Enzo delivers. More affordable, longer lasting, range extending tires. Enzo is coming to America with a pioneering carbon neutral factory that will change the tire industry creating high-skilled jobs, strengthening America's supply chain, making electric vehicles more successful. Join our journey. Enzo is building the future of the tire industry. And we're now actually looking for a home here in the United States. And again, this is existing technology, but we're accelerating this technology by delivering it to the most demanding electric vehicle use cases, the ones that drive the most, the electric fleets that operate our cities, the urban heroes that keep our cities operating at pace, because that is how we tackle this and create the best impact. Now, as I said, this is all based on existing technology. But I have to warn you, we won't make the tire last forever. We will make it, however, last a lot longer, make it inert to the environment, and ultimately address the whole ecosystem of the tire with a circular economy. Because Enzo actually means circle in Japanese. So it's very important that we keep talking about tires. Without this conversation, the industry will not shift. Without regulation to drive the change, it won't happen, except at our scale. But critically, as you all move forward, what we want to make sure is that the conversation continues. So I want to thank you so much for listening. I want to thank Bloomberg, of course, for hosting us. We're really, of course, proud that Prince William recently nominated us for the Earthshot Prize, which has helped us to scale our solution now. And let's together make electric vehicles more successful. Thank you very much. of an A-team.
Please welcome to the stage Scott C. Burns, screenwriter, director, and producer. Dorothy Fortenberry, writer and producer. Anna Jane Joyner, founder and CEO of Good Energy. Shanna Swan, professor of Mount Sinai and UCSF and senior scientist of EHS. And Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr., president and CEO of Hip Hop Caucus, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Meg Zabo. of the Green Festival. Are we all so excited? Okay, we're trying something completely new here, um, so you're gonna have to bear with us because this is a completely new experiment. Um, and this is by far the most speakers I have ever had on a stage together. <laughs> so um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I have the most incredible panel of storytellers ever on this stage right now. And I'm gonna go through exactly what we're about to do and like what the logistics of that and how it's all gonna work. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to hand it over to Scott and to Anna Jane, who have kind of been br coming up with this concept as a way to talk about and show how important storytelling is to the climate world and how we can move the climate movement forward. Um, so Scott, why don't we start with you and talk a little bit about what it is we're trying to accomplish with what we're doing here tonight. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> About 20 years ago, I had the good fortune of being one of the producers on An Inconvenient Truth. And when the movie came out and you know we had a fair amount of recognition and won an Oscar and all <laughs> sorts of great things happened, actually won two Oscars, um, <laughs> Davis Guggenheim, the director and I went and had a conversation and I said, well, like, you know, what do we do next? Because obviously that's solved. <laughs> so we realized that that wasn't solved and it, I started thinking about why, why didn't that work? Because um, the movie seemed so obvious and compelling to us and then we realized we are people who, who love documentaries and are reached by things like facts. Other people don't have the same wiring and that's really important to know you know, and I'll just give you a really quick example because there's a lot of things we want to do tonight, but years before that, I had been an oil spill volunteer in Homer, Alaska, um, in Seward, Alaska, um, but it was this whole Exxon Valdez sort of disaster, and one of the scientists up there had done a study about steam cleaning the beaches. I don't know if you all remember that, but when they did that, they killed accidentally um, these little sort of, you know, microorganisms that lived on the beach. What they didn't really know at the time was those microorganisms are what told the salmon where to go. And a salmon in the Pacific Northwest, as all of you know, um, go back the same stream they came down usually, and so to not have that information is a tragedy. The bigger tragedy was this. Um, the indigenous people who run their calendar, who raise their children, who do so many other things based on the salmon run, suddenly none of their myths worked. And so I can tell you the first part about the steam cleaning of the beach, or I can tell you a story about an indigenous community that was decimated by, by the steam cleaning of the beach and I can tell you that the young people in that community saw a huge increase in alcoholism and there were a lot of other problems. Now, just from the groans, I think I know as a storyteller where the power lies. And that's really what we want to get into tonight. Anna Jane. Um, so I'm Anna Jane Joyner. Thank you especially to everyone here, to Bloomberg Green, also to Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, Good Energy, my nonprofit, who works with amazing writers, wouldn't exist without Bloomberg Philanthropies. So we're so grateful. Um, I got into this because I've been working on climate my whole adult life for two decades uh, since college. And um, I'm also the daughter of an evangelical megachurch pastor. <laughs> and 
I kind of, uh, I think anyone who's raised in a kind of more intense religious setting sort of innately understands the power of story because religion is just a set of stories that has profound impacts on the world for very uh, good and very bad ways. Um, and I knew growing up in the climate movement, um, coming from, my dad's also an author, he's written over 100 books, my brother's a filmmaker, all of my brothers and sisters are artists and musicians, and I knew that there was something missing in the climate movement, the, the heart piece, the emotions piece, the par part that moved us, not just on an intellectual level, but an emotional level. And I went through a pretty rough time around about 2016, I don't know if y'all remember what was going on <laughs> during that time, but I was in a pretty dark place, and I, you know, I've struggled with a lot of climate and anxiety and grief. I live on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, uh, and that was a real thing. And where I go to to find meaning and courage is stories, and television and film in particular. And I knew that it was a big problem that my uh, I wasn't seeing my world reflected on screen. And I knew that if I was feeling that way, then there were many, many millions of other people who were also craving. Uh, feeling seen, you know, feeling like our lives, uh, you know, are are worthy of, of stories to be told as well. And so that is why I started Good Energy. Uh, basically, it was both strategic, like uh, we cannot win on climate without more and better stories. Aside from religion, Hollywood is the most powerful storytelling engine in the world. And it was also very personal. I need these stories. So that is how I got here. Thank you both. Yeah. All right, so this is what we're going to do. <laughs> we want to put to practice how important this, the power of storytelling is and show that here, and especially in Hollywood in the fictional stories or you know, stories that you're watching, not documentaries. So what we're going to do is we have the lovely Shauna here who's going to share some science with us. Uh, we're going to ask some follow-up questions to her, get a little bit of background. And then our wonderful writers on the end here, Dorothy and Scott, are going to go off and do some pitches. We're going to do a poll to the audience so you can pick what kind of pitch you would like to see. Um, they're going to do a couple. They're going to go in the back. They're going to write. They're going to go with Shauna so that they can you know, ask her any follow-up questions. And then they're going to come back and share their pitches with us, and we're going to see what we all think. Um, while they're gone, I'm going to continue a conversation with these two lovely folks over here. And we'll talk a little bit about the power of storytelling, show some clips, show some examples, talk about it, and, um, and then they'll come back and we will uh, end there. So that's, that's what's ha gonna happen. So Shauna, over to you. Why don't we start with a little bit about your story and the, some of the work that you're doing and, yeah. um, and why you're here with us. <laughs> thank you, Meg, and thank you for the invitation. And so wonderful to talk to everybody. It's always very hard to see. <laughs> <laughs> who's there. But um, uh, I have um, been chasing this question of how chemicals in the environment affect our health. I'm an epidemiologist, um, and I got focused on sperm decline after I read a paper in 1992 that said sperm count had declined 50% in 50 years. And I would, I'm a skeptic, so I said, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> so then I spent six months trying to make it go away, and I could not. And then I thought, oh, okay, maybe that's real. And if it's real, it's got to be environment. It's too fast for genetics, it has to be environment. So then I started designing these studies to look at environment and reproductive health. And the rest followed, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about that journey now. But for me, it's kind of, a, you know, it's, it was a mystery story. Like, why is it going down? What's happening to the world? And that led to many other mysteries, which maybe can be built into something that we're going to build together. OK, so should I just start? Yeah, let's get, yeah. Yeah, let's get All right, right into let's it. Let's go. All right, so um, this is my cover slide. <laughs> Environmental toxins are threatening our ability to reproduce. That is my thesis, and that I, I hope I'll convince you of if you're not already convinced. So um, I mentioned that I studied sperm decline, but I didn't tell you that when I finally put, you know, <laughs> pedal to the metal, I did a very, very large, the largest study of its kind ever with colleagues all over the world, and we showed that in this very large meta-analysis that sperm count had actually declined 
a lot. And this is sperm count, there's also concentration, around 50 to 60 percent in about 40 years. And that's faster than 1% a year. And you might think, oh, 1%, that's not very much. But if you think if this was IQ and you looked at a 60% drop in IQ, <laughs> yeah. So um, when we published this, it went viral. And there were papers you know, referring to it all over the world, magazines, you know, <laughs> and um, the Newsweek cover, which really clinched it, you know. <laughs> and um, this was the most cited paper in the year it was published in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Not the most, I'm sorry, 27th most cited, close. And, and then we thought, well, okay, now we did that. We, there were some unanswered questions. One of them was, what about men who were had been proven to be fertile. Well, we put those aside and, and, and didn't focus on those. And actually, that I'm not going to talk about those. But then there's a, this was all about Western men. So what about the rest of the world? Asia, Africa, South America. They were not in this first study because there wasn't enough studies. So is this worldwide? And what's happened? The most critical question. What's happened? Has it gotten better? Everyone hoped. And here's the answer. The answer is that it had not only not gotten better, it's gotten a lot worse. So if you look at the studies, this, you know, back to 1973, the rate of decline was around 1% per year. Studies after 2000, over 2% per year. I hope that scares you, because it's definitely getting worse. And we saw that when we did get studies from those continents that hadn't been represented, that this was a worldwide problem. So let me just stop there and have you think about that. Worldwide sperm decline is decreasing between 1% and 2%, I would say, a year. OK, what about fertility, sperm counts related to fertility? Well, this is a nice graph. It shows the total fertility rate. That's how many children a couple or a woman has in their lifetime. OK, and it's a demographic thing that you know, they, demographers rely on. But if it's two, him and her, and a little bit more, because there's a little loss, 2.1, that's called replacement. So if the population is at 2.1, they're good to go. They're gonna keep replacing themselves. And what I have to tell you is that today, in 2024, we are below replacement in the world. And some countries are a lot worse. South Korea, this, I'll show you some numbers. We're now down at 2.2, but now I just got the latest. <laughs> 2024, it's, it's, it's actually 2.08. And um, South Korea is at 0 0.8. And the Korean government cannot pay people to have children. They tried. No financial incentives will bring this number up. So there, this is a really scary story, but it's not just this that's going on. So let me show you some other things. Can I click this? Ah, the one percent. Okay. So it's not just males, and it's not just semen quality. Men have other things to worry about, right? They worry a lot about the size of their genitals. <laughs> they're, they're getting smaller. <laughs> that is, if the mother was exposed to certain plastics prenatally, or certain chemicals like phthalates, then her boy is more likely to be born with smaller genitals. Okay, testosterone is going down. Men care a lot about that. Women should care as well. Erectile dysfunction is going up. Women have poorer egg supply at the end of their life than they should. The quality of the eggs are going down. Miscarriage rates are going up. Uterine abnormalities are going up, and they share infertility, damaged sperm cells, and low libido. So interestingly, this is really happening at around the same rate. I call it the 1% effect, and it's continuing. OK. And it's not just humans. Now, this is really critical, because when demographers particularly talk about the decline in fertility, they say, oh, well, that's because people are waiting longer. They want to stay in the workforce. They want to make money. Um, they choose not to have children. That's all true. 
but it doesn't explain the decline in fertility in wildlife species and domesticated animals. And the same trends that we're seeing in humans we see in the wildlife and in domesticated animals. In fact, right now, over 26,000 species are in danger of extinction. And they are exposed to the exactly the same chemicals we're exposed to. So these chemicals. Are we part of that 26 species that are going out? Are we one of the are we one of the 26 species that are oh, going oh, out? Oh, actually, we, actually, we're not. We are endangered. Yeah, we're threatened. Actually, by technically, we're threatened. It's a little fine line. A whole um, other a whole other science that we're not even going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> we're all about sperm. Yeah. So, <laughs> what chemicals am I talking about? I'm talking about particularly the chemicals that can mess with our hormones. These are the ones that are going to drive reproductive failure. They're going to drive changes in neurodevelopment, which we're also seeing, changes in immune function, which we're also seeing, and on and on and on. Well, the hormones are really, really critical for healthy development. And most importantly, they're in critical for when the fetus is in early pregnancy. So, all of this work you know, points to the fact that pregnant women and men about to conceive a pregnancy are really, really important to the story and have to be extremely careful because whatever changes they put in place in the womb will never be fixed. They are permanent. Unlike changes you get if you smoke when you're 26 years old, okay, you can stop and you'll get your sperm count back. If your mother smoked, you're out of luck. So what are we going to do? I don't have the answers for you. I'll tell you how big the problem is. <laughs> 350 chemicals registered for commercial production, and that number is going up. Very few of these have been tested in our country. We don't have to test before we market. We test on people, the guinea pigs, who are all of us. Okay, And since there's a lot of emphasis on plastic, now, and I, uh, I should point out that about 1,600 of these are in plastic, and now we're seeing them in these micro and nanoplastics, which I don't want to take a lot of time on, but it poses a new problem because there's a physical particle and there's also the chemical of which it's made, both of which are threatening health. So my last slide is to tell you that almost every piece of plastic is produced from fossil fuel. Rev's hat. <laughs> Plastic proliferation threatens climate on a global scale. This is not only a plastic story, but plastic is an important part of this story. So I'm going to stop there and just say thanks and answer questions. Thank you, Shana. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over now to Rev, who is also one of our experts here, CEO of Hip Hop Caucus, uh, to share a little bit more on his side of what he has seen um, relating to the science, and then we'll hand it over to Scott and Dorothy to ask a couple of questions before they leave us. Rev. No, definitely. I always, I mean, it was a great presentation. Thank you. I just thought it was just something when everybody was like, less sperm, everybody started clapping at the end there. So <laughs> it's a little thing about the audience we have tonight. So, um, <laughs> oh man, I screwed my next hat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can, you know what I'm saying? I'm taking ideas <laughs> in the chat. Uh, you know, <laughs> stop fossil fuels, more sperm. I don't know. We'll, 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 figure, we'll figure it out. Let Scott and make, make some, yeah, storytellers give us some ideas. Um, so you, you got to laugh so you don't cry, right? Um, I'm, I am from a place where uh, there is the, the development of petrochemicals um, and plastics. Plastics are oil and gas um, that is impacting our community. Um, I, I, I want to say this, and I want to, you know, thank you for the presentation. But the reality is that um, this goes to the reproductive aspect, which is critically important. The part here is that there are people who are dying before that. Um, and that's the other part to this. Um, so I just want to share a quick story because we're in this. 
One, I just want to say that the reality is that there is a villain in this story. The fossil fuel industry is a villain. They have, this, they have these numbers. They have these reports. And they know what's happening to other humans, including their own humans that they take care of. And so I think that's important in this. I think it's also important to know that they spend a lot of money on storytelling. Uh, while our, our industry spends about only about 2% of money around uh, putting uh, resources into our storytelling, they spend upwards of $750 million a year um, to tell their side of the story. I think we should understand that. Um, the, the reality is that the idea of plastics is the end around process for them. They realize that we are stopping our consumption to some degree on oil and gas. And so the idea of single use plastics is the way that they can continue their business plan. Um, so let me say this uh, before our writers go off. Um, the reason why I am so passionate about the need for us to tell better stories and narrative is simply in my community uh, that is called Cancer Rally, is that I have been um, a part of too many funerals. 68% um, of particularly black people live within 30 miles of a coal power, power plant, uh, which is another problem called an asthma, emphysema, and cancer. But the one thing I just want to share is that, and just for you, and I need to give you this visual, is the fact that at one of these funerals, um, there was uh, a young girl who died because of asthma, and her mother was choosing between paying, paying for food or an inhaler. It looked like there were good days, and so I don't understand how particular matter works. Um, she made a decision to buy food for her family um, and not the inhaler. When she came home, her daughter was on the floor of the living room with an empty inhaler, meaning that she had died trying to figure that out. The whole time when we were doing this funeral in a room like this, this is what I'm telling the story, the casket was, if it was in a, ch a child's casket, it's one of the worst things, actually. It's no bigger than the markings uh, on the floor here, just about that big, actually. The whole time we're doing that, that mother was running down steps like these, trying to get into that casket because she felt guilty. Um, her sister, her cousins would stop her. She would get away, and at times she would run into the casket, knock the casket over little girl's arm would fall out the casket. Um, we were trying to catch the little girl as her body was stumbling at the casket and catch the mother. Um, these are the things that the fossil fuel industry is doing. These are the pain of that parent who lost their child. Because we're talking about plastic and oil and gas. Know that your neighbors <coughs> your grandmothers, <coughs> your siblings are dying for somebody else's profit. And that madness must stop. And we must tell stories at the best of our ability to stop that madness. Thank you. OK, I don't know how, <laughs> wow, that is going to be a lot to um, try to fit into some stories. Um, <laughs> they're good at. Got, got, so should we uh, talk about genre? <laughs> yes, so let's talk about genre. Um, let's do a poll, see what kind of genre you guys would like to see. We're going to keep it secret, and we'll reveal it uh, at the end when uh, both Dorothy and Scott come back, um, and we'll, they will reveal. But if you want to just scan the QR code, you can do the poll. And all of these genres uh, can be a climate change story. That's, I think, part of what yes. we're, we're here to say is that there's not like one genre that's climate storytelling, and if you don't have a shot of a tsunami, you aren't doing fiction? a climate story, that you can do any kind of climate story. And I, didn't, I just want to, before they go off, our amazing writers, um, Scott Z. Burns, Dorothy Fortenberry, they both did the show Extrapolations, if anybody watched that on Apple Plus. <laughs> amazing storytelling, also terrifying. I just, the Mumbai episode where everybody's sleeping it. at nighttime, oh, or sleeping 
during the day. Which is a real um, thing now. Yeah, yeah, is really happening. So um, that is our reality. Dorothy also did Handmaid's Tale. So oh. that <laughs> is eerily <laughs> pertinent to this. Yeah. <laughs> Which is now coming to yeah. life. <laughs> and is started by an uh, environmentally induced fertility crisis, FYI. Yes, so that is also what we are seeing here. Um, <laughs> but just so we know, back in our little private writer's room, like even if you just do a show of hands or whatever, how many people would like us to try and whip up a thriller mystery thing? All right. Comedy? Wow, comedy's really popular. Um, action adventure. All right. Horror. <laughs> it's already too, it's right. already too much more. Yeah. Romance. <laughs> always, ah. always big. Right. <laughs> I vote. Any yeah. questions before you guys head off? I don't think so. Good. I don't think so. Okay, amazing. So are so they going to ask me questions? No, no. you're going to come with us. Leave. We're kidnapping you. And you're going to go, you're going to ask questions. You're their on-call expert. Yeah. The expert in the right exactly. Exactly. Questions are going to come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got more that. to cover. Um, you have 20 minutes. All right. The timer starts now. See you in a few. See Happy you. Happy See you soon. Please welcome back to the stage Anna Jane Joyner, founder and CEO of Good Energy. You're here. And Reverend Lennox Yearwood. <laughs> Woo, you're back. <laughs> okay. Um, so can I have the clicker back, yes, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I am gonna, there we go, put it here. Um, great, so we obviously heard from both of you already about why climate storytelling is so important, both extremely powerful and personal stories, which I really appreciate. Can we do, I just would like to go into it a little bit more yep. and really talk about the power of climate storytelling. So Rev, one of the things you shared, which I found, I mean, that story was unbelievable. As a person with asthma, it's just, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Yep. Um, but what you really uh, highlighted is how the fossil fuel industry is really using climate or using storytelling, climate storytelling, in the opposite direction. Can you share just a little bit more about how we need to kind of utilize it as a tool that we are using in the climate movement against them rather than them using it against us? Yeah, no, most definitely. So the first thing I think, you know, I've been in, in the climate movement now for over 20 years. I, I came into this space through Hurricane Katrina. I was actually was in Washington, D.C. Um, and there's nothing worse than seeing your, your city and your home be impacted by a, a hurricane. And then you're looking at landmarks and like, hey, that's, if that's underwater, then that's not a good thing. Um, and then the after effect of that, seeing people left behind, particularly black, brown, indigenous, young people, queer people uh, left behind, um, to literally fend for themselves. So that's that's my kind of origin story in this. I was always in hip hop, um, had been working a lot with a lot of different folks in that, in that genre. Um, and so there was a connection there from the very beginning to use uh, one's cultural expression to shape one's political experience. About, for me, particularly as a black person, um, it, it was important because that has always been using stories has always been used as a part of our liberation. So uh, down by the riverside was not a story about um, an, an amazing Palestinian Jew named Jesus, but it was a story about escaping from the plantation. And so we would hide though the, the stories of freedom in either the lyrics or the plays or however we were telling the story. So. The thing for me was that what was missing when I, when I got into the climate movement, I was just almost kind of struck at how people weren't using, they weren't telling stories that was about liberation, they was telling stories about data and research and facts. Um, and it was just, it, was, it seemed to have a lot of white paper energy, um, so to speak. <laughs> and so it, it was, I'm sorry, that's my, I, 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 I'm trying to, I ain't trying to offend nobody in that one, but you know. But it was one of those situations where it was just very heavy. And so at the Hip Caucus, we began to work and see how we could work with communities to tell their stories. And so that was the beginning of that. And since then, we've told a number of stories um, that have connected the dots. So one story for me, obviously, my role, 
kind of the perks of being the present CEO is that you could tell a story about your home, Louisiana, and the story particularly about how horrible that was, but also more importantly, what could be done to move forward. So we actually did do a comedy called Ancient Mama's Heat Wave with comedians, and then a follow-up to that in Norfolk, Virginia, which was called Underwater Project, looking at the public housing and how they're most impacted. The thing I would just say before, because I'm also on the advisory board with Good Energy, which is just an amazing uh, organi organization and you're, that has done some of this research. The thing I think is really important in this is now is the aspect that we, as a, as a philanthropic side of our movement, doesn't understand how important it is to invest um, into in storytelling. And the problem with that is that I think that on the climate movement, they see storytelling kind of like the, you remember those, those clip-on, maybe y'all too young for this, but there used to be this thing with the clip-on shades. Some of y'all know what I'm talking Some of y'all, quiet, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, y'all making sure. Some of y'all too young, but some of y'all like, y'all know what I'm talking about. I see some hands back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So there was this yeah. clip-on thing you would buy that was, you would clip on your glasses when you went outside, but when you went inside, you would take it off. The thing that our movement doesn't understand is that they think of storytelling that way. They think of it as just something you put on only in certain situations, but not really part of the prescription. And so what we have to change now, understand that, to, be, to actually win on climate, we need storytelling to be part of the prescription. It needs to be part of how we're, what we're doing to broaden our movement, what we're doing to educate our movement, what we're doing to encourage and energize our movement. So I think that's the one thing that we're, we're seeing. So at, at, the, at the caucus, we're doing that. I wanted to say one thing that I think is important, maybe a little, not provocative, but I think it's important for us to discuss. Um, I mentioned there's $750 million that, they're, that the industry is putting into, fossil, fossil, fossil fuel industry is putting into storytelling. The thing that's important in that is this. They also know that the climate movement is a siloed, segregated, predominantly white-leaning movement. And they exploit that as well. So they figure out if they're only from Sonoma County in California or in Vermont, and it's only, I like Birkenstocks, but if it's only Birkenstocks and Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> then they exploit that. Meaning that we're telling stories from privilege. And we're telling stories that actually we feel comfortable about. Because we don't want to deal with our own issues. Because if we tell stories about racism, and we tell stories about, about injustice to women and queer rights, and we tell stories about li literally capitalism, other aspects to that process, then that will expose our own thing. So I just want to add that as a, as a lever to this, that we need to change not only the movement, and the movement has its own culture. Please believe that. But to win on climate through storytelling, it means that we allow storytellers that don't look like us, sound like us, come from where you are to actually tell those stories. Um, thank you, Rev, and thank you for being one of our advisors, um, <laughs> as is Scott and Dorothy. Um, but it makes me think, another one of our advisors is named Dr. Angus Fletcher, and he is a story scientist. So he studies how different story structures evoke different emotions. He has degrees in neuroscience and in literature from Yale. Um, and he has this great quote I think about all the time, that there's this mythology that storytelling is the best form of communication, but it's actually the only form of communication. Because if you're not being given information in a compelling story, you're either attaching it to a story you already have, or you're just completely shutting it out. And that is why when you see a really gripping movie, uh, it, it might change your life, but if you see a PowerPoint uh, presentation, Sometimes you need it packaged within a story. And that, um, that is why good energy exists. Uh, and that goes back to our evolution. Humans have been telling stories for over 30,000 years. It was for two reasons. One, because prior to the written word, uh, stories are, the better the story, the more memorable it was. So the more often it would be passed on to future generations, to other uh, people outside of your community. The second reason uh, is because it was how we have always grappled 
with the inevitable you know, hardships and tragedies of being alive. Uh, it's how we've found courage and community, how we've made meaning. And so especially in this kind of global existential crisis, the fact that storytelling uh, has not been a core part of the ingredient for how we solve this crisis is a really big problem. Um, which is why Rev and I do, do what we do. Um, but uh, just to take a little bit of a step back, uh, how I got here, uh, my father's an evangelical megachurch pastor. He's also a climate denier. Uh, people love the drama of that story, and <laughs> some might even say it's made for TV. And that is how I ended up getting uh, involved in this. A writer from Madam Secretary uh, reached out to me. He wanted to tell a story about a young woman challenging her powerful evangelical uh, father on climate change and in his research came across a former intern of mine who was like, you know that's a real person, right? Um, and because my brother is a filmmaker, I'd read a lot of scripts and I'd given notes on scripts and I come from a fa family of storytellers so I know a lot about the storytelling uh, process and the screenwriting process and it was just a really great creative partnership. I also knew, having worked in climate communications for uh, I think around 15 years then, uh, that we really needed more uh, climate in television and film and that we weren't seeing very much of it. Um, so I was like, Alex, can you just put me in touch with every screenwriter <laughs> that, that you think will talk to me so I can get on the phone and figure out why we're not seeing more climate on screen and what we can do to change that, what kinds of support systems that writers and executives need to be able to portray climate in compelling ways on screen and uh, really started with a personal campaign. That was at the end of 2018. By April 2019, Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Sierra Club came on as our first partners and funders, and we just hit five years in July. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can you share a little bit more about the book here we're currently holding. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, well, so one of the first things that we did is we, uh, we, that kind of just me getting on the phone talking to anyone who would talk to me, uh, that form of deep listening has become a really core part of our DNA as an organization. So our director of strategy comes out of IDEO where he managed their uh, audience research and market research and we've talked to hundreds of TV and film writers and everything that we do, everything from our brand uh, and visual identity uh, to the offerings that we provide is based on that ongoing deep relationship with our audience and always making our work better. Um, and so this is a playbook for screenwriting in the age of climate change. It's just a teaser, uh, but the full thing is available online. Uh, it's also, uh, it's written for screenwriters uh, in partnership with amazing advisors like Reb. Um, actually, our, our most popular um, part of it is the villain's backstory, <laughs> which is co-written by Amy Westervelt. Um, so yes, go check it out. It's also super useful for just storytellers and communicators of all forms. Um, but another book that just came out that I'm obsessed with is called You Are What You Watch, uh, How Movies and TVs Affect, Movie and TV Affects Everything. And it literally goes to everything, like how we, the dogs, uh, when, a, when a specific kind of dog is shown positively on screen, breeds of that, those dogs go up. After Braveheart came out, tourism in Scotland went up 300% the next year. Like it is, it just has these profound impacts on our lives in both very subtle, funny ways to deeply problematic ways, like the fact that the fossil fuel industry has been in Hollywood since the inception of Hollywood. They have spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, creating the stories that we now all live under. They had a relationship with Disney in the 1940s where Mickey Mouse and all of the characters went on big road trips around to standard oil stations. They paid for an Oscar-nominated film in 1948 called Louisiana Story about a little boy and his pet raccoon that glorified the oil industry. Not a pet raccoon. <laughs> yes, a pet <laughs> raccoon. This, you know, and they're there today. Saudi Arabia uh, just opened one of the biggest film funds in the world. Uh, they've been there spending much more money, much longer than we have. And actually, Dorothy uh, said this great quote right before we were walking out. She was like, it's not that climate storytelling hasn't been around until now. It's that the fossil fuel industry is the ones telling the climate stories. Right. And like that is a big problem. So anyways, 
This guy is a data scientist. He is a Pulitzer winning data scientist. The entire book uses data science and sci like research and graphs. It's incredible, it's also really entertaining. But one of my favorite things about it is the reason he became a Pulitzer winning data scientist is because of Jeff, Gloom, Jeff Goldblum's character on Jurassic Park. So <laughs> you just think about, think about the movies that have changed your life, I mean the Newsies taught me how to be an organizer way before I had language for it. Um, so yeah. um, wonderful. So uh, Rev, we were just piggybacking on talking about the fossil fuel industry and how they have been using climate storytelling. Yeah. Can you share, you have shared a lot about your amazing, I mean, your personal story and all of the experience that you have had, but what can we do to combat that and, and change that? So one, I mean, I think we have to grow the movement. Um, and so I'll talk about this more so from what we do, have done at Hip Hop Caucus. Um, one of our great win stories is with the amazing singer Beyonce. Um, and we were doing the home album, which is called Healing Mother Earth, which actually now turned 10 years. And we had an amazing artists uh, in that uh, who were part of that. It was uh, Neo, Common, um, Elvon, actually we have one here tonight. Hopefully she will sing, to, she will sing, but that's good, like a little plug on that. Uh, Antonique Smith is here, Broadway, uh, and amazing singer, Grammy nominated singer and actor. Um, and so- yeah, I left that part out. We've got a little performance at the very end. Yeah. So stay tuned stay for that tuned too. Stay tuned for we that. We've got everything on this session. <laughs> the thing that was important around with Beyonce is that we were doing that and her song that we were writing for her uh, with Malik Youssef, was a song that actually was called Sandcastles, is what she thought at the time, which was the, the water coming in, you building up these sandcastles, then the water going out. We didn't make it on the home album, but it actually made it on Lemonade. Why that's important is that then from there, the next thing is that once that plug, once we begin to even peer to peer, something on that level, when um, the, remember the, the power outages in Houston happened, her and Stevie Wonder were at something, and then she spoke out about that. And then recently, with her, her country um, album and song, there's nothing but climate things in that. So I just want to say that even for the people who are, you think, at the top level, when you're talking to them about this crisis, and, and they understand particularly how it impacts vulnerable communities, people who look like them, they want to get involved. So that's literally Beyonce, Beyond, that Beyonce, <laughs> um, who literally then goes from literally writing a song that's on her album Lemonade to then writing an album that has nothing but climate imagery in it and continuing to do that, right, and organize. So that's one way. But the other part to this, I think, which is very important, that goes back to what I said earlier, is the part of the investment um, of telling stories that reflect. And so what we have seen, particularly in, this, in our, this recent film that we've done called Underwater Projects that actually stars Wanda Sykes, it is in there that it goes back, it goes to the community, which is also very, very important. Because a lot of times, people are telling stories that engage with trauma porn, and telling stories about people in a, in a very bad light, but not giving them the opportunity not to just be revolutionary, but to be solutionary. For me, one of the most important things with the climate crisis is how do I see particularly all people, particularly black people in the future? What does that future look like? How can we ensure that those communities, that they have clean air and clean water? And when you begin to talk about it differently in a way that those communities can see themselves in a better place, then we begin to see stories change. And that's, I think, one of the most important things we've seen as a success at the Hip Hop Caucus. So we have a couple of clips. Do we want to set up the first yeah. one that we're going to look at? Yeah. Um, is the first one extrapolation? Yeah. Or at the moment? Yeah. So first one's extrapolations, yep. Awesome. It is possible that you are the last one of your kind. We cannot find any others. Just you. Then it is time for me to fall. You said that when you fall, it starts over. 
You become all that follows. You return what is taken. Yes. It is possible that one day there will be more of you. When? It will take time. More time than either you or I have. But what you have told me, what we have said to each other, that will feed more new ones. But how will it be different next time? Mm. So this is from Scott and Dorothy's show, Extrapolations, on, <laughs> on Apple TV. Um, that went well. <laughs> one thing I just have to emphasize, uh, this is the first television, scripted television show that has ever centered climate change. So these are two of the true pioneers and most courageous people out there calling for more of these stories. Uh, that was from episode two. Uh, one of the reasons I really love that episode in particular is because I've worked on climate for two decades. I've thought a lot about all kinds of different climate issues. One that I have, uh, hadn't really emotionally faced was biodiversity loss. And that one, that episode is really focused on biodiversity loss. And so it took this huge esoteric thing that I intellectually understood and it brought it home, right? Like I sobbed watching that episode. I'm close to tearing up now. And I think that is the great power of story, you know, in a nutshell. So when we work with screenwriters, we um, support everything from whole new television shows focused on climate uh, to when it just comes up in passing about in stories that have nothing to do about climate. So I wanted to show you a clip from one of those. This is Abbott Elementary, one of the most popular shows on TV right now. Um, so next, let's show the next clip. Yes. Um, for career day, and you see a mural. The mural you worked so hard on with your classmates. Your legacy. Now, in your mind's eye, is that mural really the Silly Sock family? Uh, yes. Of course. All I am saying is, you like the Silly Sock show now, but you might not even remember it in 20 years. But you told us that we're all going to be dead in 20 years from climate change. I said unless we act now. We're in school now. How are we supposed to act? Look, we are not doing the Silly Sock show, okay? <laughs> A fun background that is Quinta Brunson, who is the showrunner and star um, of Abbott Elementary, she intentionally put climate in her show. It was very important to her that this was a part of the world of the story, that it came up in comedic ways and all kinds of ways. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a central part of the story, but it's a part of the world of the story that comes up in usually very funny ways. Um, one other just thing to leave you with, um, Madam Secretary, the episode that I worked on, the first show that I worked on, has a character loosely inspired by me, um, challenging her powerful evangelical father. Our partners at Rare just did an impact study on that episode. So they looked, I mean, surveyed thousands and thousands of people. So this is a statistically verifiable study. Um, and they found that viewers were three times more likely to identify as a climate single issue voter, which means that they will not vote for a candidate who does not commit to taking action on climate. Three times more. And that was just one episode. We also did research on Scott's show with USC, and we found that the similar 80% of the people we surveyed uh, reported taking action as a result of watching the show. So these uh, things have profound influence on shaping all of our lives in our world. All right, thank you both so much. We are, <laughs> I think we are ready to welcome back our uh, writers um, so we can bring them back in with Dr. Shauna as well. And uh, time for the reveal. Welcome back. Yay! <laughs> All right, pitch reveal time. <laughs> we, we actually already sold it. So, <laughs> so we'll be seeing you. Can't talk room. about it. Sorry. <laughs> um, All right. All right. No one tell the guild that we did this. <laughs> you want to go? Um, sure, yeah. I think we're just going to... Scott and I are just going to tag team this, so interrupt me all the time. Um, the 
first th uh, genre that we heard was comedy. There were a lot of votes for comedy. So um, we have a comedy to pitch to you called Florida Man. And we it's need- It's based off the alligator <laughs> slide. Yeah. <laughs> And the alligators we, were in Florida. We meet our main character. His name is Travis, and he is a super macho bro. And he loves, you know, working out. He loves, like, listening to Andrew Tate. Um, he just loves being as masculine as possible <laughs> until the devastating day when his penis does not work. <laughs> and he has a tragic experience of erectile dysfunction with his girlfriend and uh, he tries to figure out what's going on. Uh, and he, it has never happened before, and he plunges into a despair, um, and then you know, learns that it's actually not his fault, that his mom was exposed to all these chemicals and plastics and phthalates uh, when he was in the womb, and that there is somebody responsible for this, that all of the CEOs of the corporations that put the plastics and these chemicals in everything, food, clothing, you know, water bottles, shampoo, everything, um, are responsible for the sad state of his junk. <laughs> and he is motivated to find revenge. So... Um, he goes on a third act kind of vigilante justice spree. Um, <laughs> and because we didn't want to kill a lot of people. <laughs> we had him come to his girlfriend and accept like that, you know, this bad thing had happened because of other people. And so she helps him use social media to publicly shame the um, CEOs of fossil fuel companies about what their sperm counts are. <laughs> so that's Florida Man, that's our comedy. <laughs> Uh, this one we call Swimmers. Um, so George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon decided to hire themselves, actually no, we decided that Channing Tatum mm. hires them to uh, rob a bank. Yeah, this is Oceans used to be 26, now it's like maybe 17 because it's going but, down every year. But this time it's a sperm bank. <laughs> and so they go in search of a sperm bank from like with with samples from the 1960s where sperm was doing a lot better based on the graphs that we just saw um, before the whole plastification of all of us. Um, so they steal a bunch of these samples and they're trying to get them back to Channing. Um, but guess what? There's a heat wave. So they start to melt. Um, and thaw, yeah. And thaw, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bad to have them sitting right next to you. <laughs> um, and in the end, they, they don't have any sperm samples for Channing, but, but Brad and George are able to convince Channing to adopt. Mm. So that is in the, the thriller uh, genre, the action adventure that was also very popular. Um, and then the last genre that we uh, saw a lot of love for was romance. Um, we were sort of surprised. There was a big, uh, big search for romance. And we talked to Dr. Shana backstage a little bit, and she mentioned that in Japan, due to a combination of all of these factors, including low libido, that without testosterone, people are just much less horny. Um, women are eschewing uh, heterosexual marriage, they're eschewing homosexual marriage, and they are marrying themselves. So we, yeah, we have a, a romance called I Pick Me. <laughs> so in I Pick Me, our protagonist, and it will look like, you know, the kind of meet cute that we're used to seeing where, you know, there's some kind of chance meeting in a restaurant or a store and someone spills something or, you know, someone falls down and it's embarrassing and by the end of the first act, um, you know, me kind of hates me. <laughs> Not expressing much interest. Me feels like I have to do something really, really desperate to get my attention. So, <clears throat> I buy me flowers, um, I, I write me a song, 
Um, <laughs> I do all sorts of things. And then? Um, you know, it's going okay. Uh, I introduce myself to my friends. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I can sort of see things going somewhere with me. Um, but I, I, I get spooked. Uh, and I cheat on myself. <laughs> and, and there's a huge fight, and it seems like things are lost. But in the last 15 minutes of the movie, I run after myself in the airport. <laughs> And I find myself, and I say, you know, I pick me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well done. That was, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, well, I think we kind of know based off of all of the applause, but should we do a quick poll and see what everybody liked the most? Number one was called... Florida, Florida Man. Florida Man. Florida Man. <laughs> Number two was called Swimmers. Swimmers. And, and then number three was I Pick Me. <laughs> I think and that the was Oscar very clear. goes. To <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, wow, that was amazing, um, Doctor. Uh, we are over time a little bit because I think we just, you know, there are so many of us up here. So I um, did want us to have a chance to just hear before we try to wrap it up um, from you, Shauna, because we did hear all of this science that is terrifying. <laughs> What can we do quickly? Could you just give us like a top four things that we can all do right now to try to remedy the problems that you have shared with us? I, uh, that's really hard to say quickly. Um, you know, I think food is our, our main source, our first source, and um, try to avoid fragrance. Don't ever microwave in plastic. Store your food in glass and metal containers and um, talk about it and try to get in touch with legislators and people who can do something about it. So we can't, it's not our job to test or, we shouldn't have to worry about what's in our food. We need to get people to take care of this for us. Yeah. Health stories. <laughs> Any last quick thoughts before we, we wrap up? I just want to say that this phenomena of Women marrying themselves is real. This is not. This is, they made a wonderful story, but it starts with a true fact. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Scott. Take it. No. I, and yeah, I that was really. You guys. That was so fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> really well done. <laughs> I would love to thank all of our amazing panelists for joining us. It was such a fun experience. Um, <laughs> we have one last thing for our session, so don't leave. You're not going to want to leave right now because we have an incredible closing performance to end out the entire festival, so oh. you will want to stick around. Um, but I'm going to let, Re we're going to all leave the stage. I'm going to let Rev introduce um, Antonique so she can, before she comes up. Great. Awesome. One more round of applause for this amazing panel. It's okay, don't worry about it. It's okay. So I think, you know, I just want to leave you with this, is that never forget that organized people beats organized money every single time. So don't, don't forget that and know that if we come together, we can win. Um, music, poetry, dance, storytelling is the thing that gives us life and joy and something that we want to pass on for future generations. A hundred years from now, we'll be 21, 24. And what we will leave for them actually will be these movies and our dance and our song and our poetry and hopefully they will have clean air and clean water. And they will look back upon us, and they won't care who the president was. They won't care anything about what we're talking about now. But what they will say is, thank you. If we win, and we will win, 
that they have clean air and clean water and a planet they can live on. So with that, the one thing that we hope to leave them with is music that will be something as a testament that we will say that this generation understood what you are going through. So with that, I'm so proud to bring up Broadway star, actress, Grammy-nominated musician, and someone who Bill McKibben called the voice of the climate movement. And so I give to you this gift that we will give to future generations to listen to the amazing, the powerful, the wonderful Anthony Smith. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction, Rev. What an amazing panel. Um, I Pick Me is autobiographical, so <laughs> that might be the one I need to be in, Scott. And thank you, Scott, for asking me to sing today. Thank you, Bloomberg. And the word art is in the word heart. The art that they are about to make and that they've been making is going to change this world. And I believe that the only way we can win this fight is with this art and a part of storytelling also is music, so I'm gonna leave us with some hope. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun, little darling. Here comes the sun, and I say it's all right.
Yes, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.